Good afternoon, and welcome to this faculty development session this afternoon. It's myself, Mary Kay Borden, and Melanie McCollum. And I think most of you know both of us. But uh, I have responsibility for several of the systems in our pre-clerkship curriculum, including Foundations of Medicine, which is our first, uh, the orientation period, and my brain and behavior this spring. And then the second year, I'm assisting in renal system. Melanie has a musculoskeletal and integument, which is winter of the first year. When Casey asked us if we would run a session on faculty development about active learning, we thought, well, we could give you our perspectives and best practices that we've seen under the curriculum, but we thought, even better, why don't we invite a student panel? <laughs> the students have 18 months of experience in our pre clerkship mm -hmm. They're through all the systems, the second year, right? And so they actually experience more active learning than Melanie and I, either jointly or individually, have designed or witnessed, right? Because they've been through all the systems. So now, at the end of their second year, or I guess midway through the second, but at the end of the pre clerkship they're in a really good position to uh, tell us what's really worked for them and things that have not worked so well and perhaps why, which is really informative to those of us who are developing active learning sessions and tweaking them and improving them all the time. So we'd be happy for you. We're going to ask them a few questions first, and we'd be happy for you also to ask. We did meet with them last week, so we sort of have the overview of, of what we're, they're going to say. And we think it's going to be really interesting. <laughs> <laughs> we were really interested to hear what they said. And yeah, surprised us with some of the comments. So I'm really quite interested. But they yeah. may have changed the PowerPoint on the day of the session. So I'd like to thank you down for volunteering. Uh, Helena, Connie, Olivia, Meredith, Nathan, and Lexi. Uh, thanks to all of you, really, for, for being willing to share your time with us and your experience with us. Uh, there we go. Okay. All right. So um, again, we met with the students last week and kind of set them up for some questions that that are very broad and just to give you an idea of you know their perspectives on this. And then we really do encourage questions for them. They're 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 great students. They're very open. Um, and in meeting with them last week, Mary Kate and I uh, actually uh, modified some of our best practices based upon uh, some of their comments. So uh, they're they're very good, very helpful, and. Uh, We'll just go ahead and get started. So the first question that we asked them is, you know, all of us have been said, okay, well, we need to do some active learning. And so we thought the first question that would be good for them to answer is, what do they consider active learning in our curriculum? So we're going to go through, um, we'll start on this end with this question. <laughs> and we're going to go through and just take a couple of minutes to give maybe two or three examples, maybe two examples of, of what you consider to be active learning, and then you all can build on that from uh, as you go along. <laughs> okay, um, so I think active learning is um, engaging in the material and more than just reading it, but also um, learning to apply it. Um, so I, I don't know how to say more eloquently than that, um, but some of the examples that I can think of, um, I really, an example would be in several sessions we've had these workshops where we get cases beforehand and then we kind of prepare them and the next day we go in with um, small groups with like a fellow, a resident, or an attending and we go over these cases um, together with the attending. Um, so that's a form of active learning to me because we're um, not just learning the material but we're forced to look at it in a case format and then analyze the case um, through the whole picture from like radiology, um, what tests we would order, um, what treatment we would do, stuff like that. So it's forcing us to think beyond the level of what we see in the classroom. Um, another one would just obviously be TVL um, because it's more than just, oh, here, take a test on what you're learning, but it's also, here are some cases. How would you guys as a group approach this case? How would this group compare to this group approach the case? And um, comparing different viewpoints on that matter. Um, uh, so briefly, just to give my sort of take on what the definition would be, I think it's when you have sort of a meeting of pre-knowledge coming into the classroom on a student level and then engaging with that with other students, hopefully to learn. So you, you, know, you come in with some amount of knowledge and you add to that by interacting with the other students. Um, so an example of that, one of the best examples I have of that is a lot of the systems um, end with the pathology section actually in the anatomy lab. And I think we sort of all agree that was one of the better examples of active learning. So 
it's at the end of the system, so there's a tremendous amount of knowledge that students are coming in with, and then we are we have the opportunity to look with typically pathology residents at different growth specimens of organs affected by diseases we've learned about. We talk about you know the different pathophysiology of the cases, what the treatment might be, what we and then we answer questions about that at the end. So I think that to me is like one of the highest levels of active learning. Um, and then in maybe more applicable to like an everyday classroom example would just be um, the clicker quizzes that we've mentioned, the sort of stopping a lecture and then checking in with the, with the class and uh, what, what's been learned and like maybe where Dr. John goes forward with the lecture. So let me just interrupt to make sure you're all aware that everyone in the class has a clicker, which is a remote control device. It's got a unique identifier, so it's tied to them. And you can use it in the class to quiz just anonymously, so for no grades, they can tell you what they think and answer the question. Or you can use it for grading and download the grade sheet afterwards. So clicker quizzes can be graded or ungraded. Um, some more examples would be we've had some classes where they're more like <clears throat> kind of complicated, I guess, physiology type things going on, and we've uh, had worksheets where we diagram things out, or we've had professors who have gone up on the overhead and diagrams and you kind of follow along. I think those have been very helpful in terms of kind of walking through things that you can read in textbooks, but it's easier to kind of hear someone walk through it step by step. Um, and also, Lexi mentioned we have um, some of the case things that we do kind of in small groups like in the library, but also sometimes we do cases just in groups in the classroom setting where we have like a survey monkey link and we um, walk through kind of cases <coughs> in a group still a group setting, but it's not necessarily as directed as like the small group ones where we have usually a um, resident or someone helping us along. So. And I completely agree with what everyone else said. Um, but more generally, for me, I really like the active learning systems where I'm talking to my classmates and trying to figure out um, either like specific quicker questions or general cases. Um, I think it just really helps me learn things when I try to explain it to other people and actually like, verbalize it when I realize like, oh, I don't really know how to say it or how to explain it. Um, so an example of this would be like the TVLs, um, the quicker questions where you maybe ask the patients or neighbors and like discuss the different um, answer choices. And then um, in cardio, we also have um, problem sets at the end of the week where we would just have like 30, 40 questions or so online to go to in a group. Um, and it was so helpful to do that because you could hear from other people like their chain of thought and then why they might have picked certain answers, why they didn't pick other answers, and then I would also contribute, you know, like, oh, I think it's this and that. And so I think for me, just like talking it out with other people really helped. Um, everything everyone else said, but in addition, <laughs> I think a common theme is that uh, what really helps the learning process is feedback. So having fellows or residents there to help work while we're, while we're doing problem sets is really helpful. In addition, for me, um, uh, for online assessments, if they're allowed to be open afterwards, we can look at them, TBL questions, um, previous quiz questions, formative, summative. Mm -hmm. The more feedback we get via like answer explanations and things, the more I feel like I'm learning. And that is a form of active learning to me because I got something wrong, and now I can look at why. And even if I'm not talking to other people, which I think is really useful as well, I'm still learning actively. <laughs> Um, just a couple more things we haven't mentioned are the anatomy labs and the histology labs. What makes them active? Um, well, in histology, we are looking at slides. We have to kind of put two and two together and connect with what we learned before. <coughs> the anatomy, we're dissecting and looking at each organ and trying to figure out what's what. So it's the fact that you're looking at or manipulating something and you're talking to someone while you're doing that. Yeah. Okay. All right, great. Um, any questions for uh, Tim at this point? Anything you'd like them to clarify on any of the... Uh, okay. And I'm going to that. So do you like to actually look in the middle of your own slides? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I personally don't like using the microscope because I can never go through a microscope, it hurts my eyes, I never figure out how to do it, and I know a lot of other people in my lab do the exact same thing. Um, it would be great if we were looking at virtual slides, I think that I take much more out of that, and working with groups instead of each person looking at a microscope, I find better because you're never sure if the person next to you is seeing the exact same thing you are. 
I would say um, an example of what we do, I think we did this in cardio, is um, we would get these virtual microscopy links, and then in the group we would work through questions together, and so that way you can, um, so that way it's not like we're all cramming on this little microscope, but we can bring up a slide and be like, oh, do you see a gland here? I see a gland here. Oh, here's the gland, and then we know, okay, we're at this um, level of the tissue or something. So um, it's discussing with your peers, um, not necessarily each person on a microscope, but they're still looking at a picture in a group together. Other question? Yeah. I got a question. Um, so almost all the examples that you guys gave, except for the one about using practice quizzes and getting feedback, even like open feedback, even if you got it right, you know, for practice exams, involve essentially group strategies or in-class strategies. There's obviously a group of students who say, well, I don't learn well that way. I prefer to watch the podcast. And I guess the question is, is there an element that can be active that a person does alone? So examples would be, are using learning objectives instead of just memorizing a handout, but having to do your reading with certain learning objectives in mind and, find, and figure out, especially learning objectives that say, describe the difference between X and Y, that's not explicit, right there in the hand that necessary. Is that active? Another question would be, can one watch a podcast and somehow get active learning out of it? Let's say it's a clicker question and you're stopping and thinking about maybe actually instead of just clicking the person watching on a podcast, I don't know, maybe they have a chance to look it up and then unpause. Is that more active in some ways or not? And, and, you have, and the question about practice questions, whether that is considered active or not. Because it's several, I've heard from some students that they don't like the, what they don't like about talking with their peers is that their peer is so persuasive <laughs> about the wrong answer that that's what gets stuck in their head. You know, so they prefer not to talk to their peers because they just want to a practice question. They only know what they thought and they can find out whether it's wrong. I, I don't know what your guys' thoughts are because obviously a certain chunk of class seems to, I don't know, maybe it's just active as hard. Like, there's a group that says, no, I'm learning fine from the podcast. I don't know what, the, what you think about that. Answer a question. We, um, we had recently, I, I taught a really good <coughs> PRL in Endo Repro. <coughs> I think it was Dr. DeBoer. He did kind of what you were saying. He actually set up the PRL so it was purely was meant for us to do on our own. Or he, in the beginning, kind of gives you a suggestion you could do this with other people. But he went through and he was telling us new information, but at the same time he set it up in kind of question format. And at times about PRL, he would say, okay, stop, think about this question, pause your video, and then play again, and I'll tell you kind of. And it was, so what I thought that was a great form of active learning. It was by ourselves. You could do it with other people if you wanted to. I don't know if anybody actually did that. But like, it did actively have you think about the, even just new material you're going through. and. Um, I would definitely think of that active learning. And um, I do, for the first question, I do feel like there are active learning sessions that you can do on your own. But kind of playing along with what Connie said, I think those are best when we have immediate feedback for it. For example, there's been a couple of histology PRLs that we do on our own, and it's like a, a PowerPoint you click through, and it's like, it'll ask, like, which one of these cells is like a coronavirus cell? And then you can kind of think about it, and then you go to the next slide, and it'll point out the cell, and you can be like, oh, did I get it right or wrong? Um, so I do think those sessions are really helpful um, if we are doing it on our own. But I think they're best if we do have like immediate feedback for it. Mm -hmm. No, I, I think I can answer, or I'd like to answer the, the question about practice problems. Um, I would actually argue that practice <coughs> problems are among the, the best form of active learning. Um, again, you would need feedback from them. So if you answer the question, or after you're done answering all of the questions, you would need to know which ones you got right and wrong, and then also why. Um, but I think that's a great way. I would imagine, especially if it's a vignette-based question, not just a yeah, yeah. question. Yeah. So to, to just briefly, like, like an aside, um, I would think a lot of times you get like the practice question at the end of each week or on exams, uh, and, it, and some every once in a while it's say like no explanation provided for it here, right? <laughs> no, I, and I think that's one of the more frustrating uh, things. I would say practice questions are phenomenal, just to reiterate. Both in group and are by ourselves, it's the only way we know we actually know it. Even if they're more first order straight questions, having to answer them just it makes us like know it better and memorize it better. So I think the more the merrier. Yeah. 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 Ye
<laughs> so I'd just like to point out, maybe Randy can comment, that um, we have goals for active learning in the classroom. So the fact that there's things they do outside the classroom which are active is great, you know, and obviously enjoyable and highly valued, but we still need the active learning to be going on in the classroom for purposes of accreditation. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering, you know, the question is, is, if there is a chunk of class that's doing it for podcast, let's say, are they losing the benefit of active learning, or is there some way to act that it is active, All right, let's depending ask on how it's done? Do you think there's a loss if you're doing it alone at home? Well, um, I was going to say, I've stopped going to class since home, probably, <laughs> so I can answer that question. Um, all of Endo Repro, I've watched on podcasts, I haven't... I feel bad. Yeah, I haven't been to um, a heme class yet either, but I watch them all on podcasts. I um, make time to watch all of them, and I think I still get the same, like one example I think of is actually Dr. Peterson's, um, the contraception problem set session, was um, we would get, he's kind of, I would say like maybe second order questions, they weren't just like first order questions, but not quite extremely elaborate case level questions. Um, about different forms of contraception, and then um, you know they would ask a question in the class, and I'm sure people in class were clicking in, but I have no idea because I'm not doing that. So I would just you know wait and think about it myself. Like I think it's this answer. Yeah, I think it's this answer. And then when, um, but it is helpful like to get the immediate feedback because then next page, next slide, she's like, yes, it was this answer because of this reason, this reason. So um, doing it, those kind of questions are helpful at home, but only if you get someone who's guiding you. Because I think there have been some times when like. You know, you got a podcast and like, think about this, think about this, and then they don't quite explain like how they wanted you to think about it. And then those aren't quite so helpful anymore because I don't know if I was on the right track or anything. So uh, it is helpful when you have someone saying like, yes, it was this answer, or I think about it this way, these are the answers I like. And um, if you're at home and you're listening to a podcast and you decide not to pause it or think about it, you just want to get the answer, that's each student's choice. And mm -hmm. it's like, and you can make it active learning if you want, and you can make it passive learning if you want. It's really up to the student. So I think that it's, it's, it's kind of individual. So I mean, that's a question even in class, like when you do a think pair share with a clicker. You can click it How much time should you spend for the pairing and the sharing right. versus <laughs> like, 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 is that too much time that people give or is that about yeah. the right amount? <laughs> this came up last time we talked about this. We thought we should move then. This is our question. Oh, sorry. Okay. <laughs> Does any other questions before we move on to, the, to our next uh, question? Go ahead, Tom. Are you going to talk about active learning outside of the classroom more? Are there talks for that? Or should I ask my question about no, that? No, we're mostly going to focus on in-class activities. So go ahead. Okay. So here's my question. Um, when I was in medical school, we had all lectures, and um, groups of us formed study groups, and we developed our own learning objectives, our own cases, our own ways to kind of figure out how to work through what we were learning in class, um, and you know, assign people to look things up, and then came back together all outside of class. Does any of that happen with you guys now, or is all of it based on exactly what the professors give you to look up? or to study your I, the learning objectives that they give you? I would say, um, I know some faculty here don't like it, but I think the Google Doc is a strong example of how we collaborate outside of class through active learning. Um, in the sense that, yeah, we do use class-recommended resources, but plenty of times, um, you know, more than half of our docs are littered with, um, oh, I found this up-to-date article. Oh, I found this new thing on PubMed that says this. Oh, I found this thing that says this. I found this thing that says this. So it's um, a way where all of us are sharing on the same avenue so all of us can have access to it together. But um, so I guess I would say we do like a class-wide, that would be simple, a class-wide um, study group that we do where um, it's not exactly like, we do split up like, oh, certain people are responsible for certain topics, but um, everyone gets to see what they bring back in. So as long as that question, you can just post yeah. a comment. Um, I do think there is less of an opportunity if you don't actively get students like uh, physically in a room together to ask questions. I feel like I haven't had as much of a chance to ask questions as I used to have, but that might just be because I haven't been trying hard enough. But I do think there's a lot of collaboration in the class in terms of studying and But it's all driven by the learning objectives you're given. So do, do people go beyond those? Yeah. On an individual level, I think a lot of, I can I'll speak for myself, um, I have been using particularly this year a lot of like board prep resources to supplement what we're learning in class alongside. So for you know, renal and fall and what have you, 
um, to supplement that because there's some things that we emphasize in class that aren't emphasized in boards and, and vice versa. So that would be completely outside the learning objectives, although in parallel to them often, um, and not necessarily in a group format. But I, I feel like that would be another example of sort of a different resource used for learning. Something that does go on outside of class um, that would does fall, I think, very simply the <coughs> learning objectives in, in most of the senses. Some of our classmates have actually started like a review group, and they've um, done PowerPoints. They put together PowerPoints, so they follow somewhat. I mean, you probably can speak about this more. Yeah. They follow the LOs, I would say, pretty much. But they come up sometimes with like case questions for us to help us. Um, they hold review sessions. They send out the material to you. If you don't go, you can kind of benefit from it. But um, I think that's also been an avenue where people can discuss questions they've had. At least amongst students, not necessarily amongst two faculty. Yeah, so yeah, just to add on that, we, we have like about um, a group of eight or so students that um, it's always the week before a test, so we do it like the week before a form, there's a week before a summative, but we split up all the topics that are responsible for that test, and then each person is responsible for making a PowerPoint to teach it to their peers. And so um, we try to follow learning objectives, but also we're encouraged by our group to um, make cases and stuff too. And then, those get sent out to everyone in our class, but then also if you do choose to show up at the session, which we always do um, like every afternoon leading up into the um, test, like it's a good time for you to just sit there and pause and talk and because it's a very small style group, so anyone can kind of talk about it. And um, I think if you're kind of trying to get at whether or not we're actually doing the I think that might be more of an individual issue, but I know some people don't use the Google Doc or use LOs at all, and they just base it off of lectures mm -hmm. and the readings. Like, I know I did that for the first half of last year, and then I still, I'll go through the, the Google Doc and the LOs, but when I go back through lectures, I don't look at the LOs at all, and that's just really, like, just based on what the, I guess, the lecture is presenting. Um, but I think that is maybe more of an individual basis on whether or not they're specifically relying on LOs. And in terms of, like, small group study sessions, I don't, I think some people might have study groups where they study with other people in class, but I think for the most part, it seems like people study on their own. But I could be wrong. Yeah. Um, I'm the opposite. I completely rely on Google Doc because I feel like sometimes the resources are a little, they're, they're a little broad and you don't know what the lecture is looking for or will be testing you on. So the learning deck is really focused on studying. Do you all know what the Google Doc is? This is a, a shared electronic <laughs> document. The whole class is on the author list. You can read and revise it. It lists every learning objective from all the sessions in one place, and they just fill it out. You know, if the learning objective is described how this happens, and somebody types out how that happens, and if someone doesn't agree, that explanation will go in and edit. Right? Every class has been doing their own. It's done without faculty supervision. Uh, we did see the one from the class of 2014 after they left the pre-question system. They give it to us as a historical document. So we don't need it, or revise it, or monitor it while it's going on. Yeah, yeah, I would, yeah I would it is. That's a really good example of active learning because um, it's really dependent on how well are your peers like agreeing with this is the right answer. And you know, we often have someone say, actually, I don't think this is right. And then everyone will go hunting for resources to prove one way or the other. And eventually someone comes up with something definitive. So mm -hmm. discussion outside class. Would you say the Google Doc is more detailed <coughs> than if there was a handout for the class? Because a fourth year told me that there's a real fear on the person, on the part of the first person writing that section, oh, yeah. that you don't want your class to fail a question because you didn't <laughs> put enough information. That's on the office. Yeah, there are three doctors, and then... <laughs> 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 All right, so we're going to move on now. We're going to talk about the stuff we do in class, for which we are responsible to the accreditation body. <laughs> and so, uh, ask, what, in your opinion, is, are the characteristics of a session that has active learning which students really value? So, good quality active learning, highly valued by students. What, what, what would characterize those kind of stuff? I'd like to start on the <laughs> <laughs> I would say, we talked about this before, but the time frame, when they're too long, everyone kind of zones out by the end, and it's just not productive anymore, so keeping it short via TBL problem set. Um, something that also comes up is the time for correction. So we're all paying attention for, let's say, the first hour and a half or first two hours where we're working on it, but sometimes there's another hour or two hours where the professor is correcting and bringing in students to answer it. 
And that's when a lot of us just stop paying attention, just because there's a finite amount of attention we can spend <laughs> for each class. And um, so one thing that was brought up is that the correction time is shorter. And, um, and if the professor corrected it themselves, instead of bringing students to, to like talk about it, because we never know if we should pay attention to everything the student is saying until the professor and the end arbitrate, oh yeah, that, that was a great answer. So then I wasn't sure if I should have paid attention or not. And um, <laughs> that, and then the small group session, someone else mentioned, but the cases, we did it in a few systems. I think the GI system really nailed them. But bringing a case home, thinking about it by yourself first, and then the next morning on Friday, it used to be on Fridays, meet in the small groups at the library with a resident or a fellow and going over something you already gave thought by yourself and um, clarifying your questions. I thought that was super. <coughs> uh, I guess, uh, I guess like we've been talking about before, instant feedback is super helpful because it helps us um, like gain more confidence in terms of remembering things and uh, integrating information like that was correct i'm not just guessing wildly here so feedback from uh whoever is running the session like especially like people with so, like having feedback from students is great and your fellow students you know we all are contributing to knowledge but you never know if it's the right thing or not so it's good if um the professor or the lecturer is able to confirm that so instant feedback helps a lot and uh yeah um, I'm very much a visual learner, so I really like the slides to be organized well. Um, and for us to have the slides beforehand is really, really nice. Um, but in terms of the organization of slides, like for example, if you're doing active based learning um, and it's case based, and let's say you're going through it and you're like, okay, what are your differential diagnoses? I would love it. I love it when the slides afterwards say, like, okay, these are the differential diagnoses that I would come up with. And then you slowly go through each differential diagnosis and explain like why that's there, maybe why some are not there. And then this will be like after we've talked a little bit about it. And then you go into like what labs do you want to order next? And then again the next slide after that would have like the labs listed and why each one is ordered. And then maybe at the end you can ask just like the question, okay, what do you think the diagnosis is? And then you'll give us some options. And then again explain like why this is not the answer and why that is the answer. Um, but I think just having that usually there for us to see and follow along as we're going through each case is really nice versus like a slide having like four questions on it and then letting us talk and then you talk but not really having anything for us to see and have like definitive answers for it. So maybe just like more organized slides for it. I think it's really nice. Um, oh, I think <clears throat> we have kind of, things can go in two different directions I feel like a lot of times in terms of um, either like multiple choice driven things where they're quicker or <clears throat> an online quiz or something like that or career response um, and I think both of them have their pros and cons and I think we get a lot of learning benefit from both of them. I think specifically in regards to the free response type of questions I think they are I think we've talked about it and that they are super helpful for our learning in terms of if based on if they're mapped to where we are in our learning, if that makes sense. Um, and additionally, when, we're, when we have to pull things out from ourselves, clearly that takes more work than just recognizing an answer. And I think those help us a lot. Um, I think the best times of those are when we have an expectation going into it, knowing it's gonna be like that. So like if we've had one set up um, previously and we kind of maybe didn't do it as well because we didn't really know but the second time we did a great job because we knew what the expectation was going into it so I think in general having clear expectations for um, the whatever the activity is helps a lot being able to be properly prepared so that we can get the best out of it because I think those free answer things can be super beneficial if we're going into it with the right um, preparation and expectations for it. Yeah, just to sort of expand on that briefly, I think um, the best class sessions that we've had are when we know exactly whether it's going to be more of a team like learning environment or more of a team like you're being tested environment. And they're, they're, you're, you're learning even in a testing environment, but uh, particularly when you're attaching grades to it, uh, it sort of shifts the, the focus on how much pre-work you really need to be bringing to the table. Um, and how, how much free work you would hope the rest of your team brings to the table. So I think going just really adding to what you're saying about what's the expectation about how much free work you've done um, and what the class session is going to look like as a result. That would be really important. Yeah. Um, I think that's all I have. Thank you.
Yeah, and I'm just going to um, echo what everyone else said. Um, in terms of the instant feedback, students and experts, um, I definitely think we all agreed last time that expert feedback is better. Mm -hmm. um, an example of something with that was, um, again, we brought up how in the cardiac session we would have these problem sets or basically these mini formatives um, of sets of questions that we would all work on together and then we would turn them in for a grade. And something that Dr. Dent did is he wouldn't necessarily go over every single question, but he would go over the ones that he saw like more than half the class missed, so it would show that we were lacking somehow in the understanding. And um, so it was, those were helpful because it would be first Dr. Dent going over it as opposed to helping, hoping you have a student who knows what's going on going over it. Um, and it was also helpful because um, he wasn't like, um, like Elena said down there, it's hard when you're going over questions that you know are pretty easy, and then you just stop. The students just stop paying attention. Um, but Dr. Dent only highlighting the ones where it was obvious that we weren't doing so well in it. Um, I think that helped like direct our attention more because we would recognize like, oh yeah, I did have a hard time with this question. Like I am curious to hear what you have to say as opposed to, oh I got that one. I'm just going to pay attention now. So um, I think those are really important. And then the pre and post work thing, um, I I always do pre work prep, so I completely agree. Like whenever we go into active learning sessions, and it's pretty obvious that some people are just there to learn versus some people already did pre work. It's really hard to like um, learn together because some people are at different levels than others, mm -hmm. and it's fine that um, some sessions we all go in not knowing things. That's okay. I just think um, it would be better if you could tell us we want you to prepare for the session versus. It's okay if you just are trying to learn and absorb something from the session because then otherwise students are at different levels and it gets frustrating and that's never good. And this is also I need to clarify because we said that we like to collaborate and then we said how we don't want to hear the answers from each other. So I don't know, just I don't know. Me hearing that said back is I, I, I was gonna comment on that. Okay. <laughs> I think I I don't know, or to look at I think like we get a lot out of collaborating and talking through things. It's just the fact of getting a final answer from someone is the difference. It's like um, and some of the problems that it's like great to be able to collaborate and we are in different places a lot of times in our learning and so someone else who got this one thing really well can explain it to me and something I got really well I can explain to someone else. That's awesome. That's like a really helpful, it has been for me, but I think it's the fact of like the final say. We're not necessarily teaching each other, we're using each other when they're with an expert to kind of yeah. Okay. We discussed this last week. We agreed that was getting closure. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That closure. <laughs> <to not hear. laughs> and one more little thing is the size of the group. So a lot of times we have group work where the whole um, table of learning school is working together, and that just never works well because people who are vocal with me tend to like shout things out, and then I think I'm being great, but then I know there are some quiet people on the table who are I have no idea if they're with me or if they're if they know something they're not even sharing with me because. They feel like they can't talk. So I think smaller groups tend to work better with three students. Anybody else want to add anything before we open it up? The one thing that uh, we commented on last week when we met with you, and you, you mentioned that the, the yeah. rewarding, being rewarded oh, for yeah. being considered relevant. Right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Uh, so I think this goes back up to the, the pre work um, that uh, both Meredith and I touched on, which is to say that when we do do pre work, uh, if, if that's something that's required for that course session, to be rewarded with that pre-work either by a grade or by making it very clinically applicable. Um, so I think some of the best sessions for me have been we study a physiology of you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is, come into class and rather than spend an extra hour of a two hour problem set on reviewing that physiology, there's this, this assumption that you know it already because you're prepared and then we spend the full two hours doing cases or a graded quiz at the beginning or both. Uh, and I think those are the best sessions because that's that's how I reinforce the learning of the physiology by seeing what happens when it goes wrong or what multiple choice questions look like and how I'm going to be tested on this topic. But I, I kind of disagree with that. Um, <laughs> just, in, just in the sense that like, I think um, in terms of the topic, like if it's a very difficult topic, like for example, like physiology to me is very difficult. Um, and so, um, I would prefer it if, yes, I did prepare before, but then you still get like a little bit of a lecture and overview at the beginning of the session before jumping right into the cases, especially if it's a very difficult subject. Um, but yeah, that's just my personal preference. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
And it wasn't necessarily graded before you moved into K-12. That would be helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Questions? Questions for our panelists? <clears throat> I have a question. I, I understand the issue of getting closure completely when you do what the expert says. But, but um, the, the literature says that the group of people will converge on the right answer. So I'm wondering what your perception is after 18 months of how often the expert changes what, you're already, what your group has already changed. Not that much, but closure is really important. I get that part. I get the closure. <laughs> so I was just wondering how much they really, other than the closure, I was wondering how much they add to your knowledge. I think closure is good for like the psychological benefit, but I, I can only think of like maybe less than five times. Like specifically I can think of those in TVLs where like yeah. the whole classroom is on this one train of thought and then the expert is like, actually, you should have thought about this. And then we're all like, oh. But um, that doesn't happen at all that often. Like um, one of the recent ones was we had an endo repro TVL and I think we all were thinking, oh, this high beta ATV must mean this. And then um, our, Dr. Gray was like, what about this multiple distinction one? And then no one in the room I guess had been thinking about that. So. That was helpful in the sense that it did got like having that um, expert feedback was helpful because obviously we were all off track there. But um, yeah, it really just it doesn't change that much. Like from it doesn't change that much, but it's like it matters a lot. I can go from being extremely frustrated because I think I'm right, but I'm not sure, and everyone else doesn't know, to just going like, yeah, you're right, and then that just it makes all the difference in my studying and my confidence and how I feel about the topic. Hello. <laughs> it turns out that what you to get to eventually, like, what things are not so great. Um, which is just, just the idea of, like, when we are asked to do kind of more strictly, like, teach other students as opposed to just the collaboration for the answer, I think most of us would say we don't pay much attention to each other just because you, you, you don't want to put in the effort necessarily to listen to something and then it'd be wrong and not put it in your head. Kind of like I think was mentioned before in terms of the collaboration with students and now you have the wrong answer in your head and that's all you have. So I think we hesitate. It's not that it's always changing, but like there's always a hesitation. So it's like you never commit to either sticking it into your head or not because it's like, well, it could be right, it could be wrong, so you just don't. But we guess you depend on the Google Doc. <laughs> you don't bring closure and enter in Google Docs. That's fair. So what do you think is the error rate in the Google Docs? We wonder that all the time. We, okay, yeah, so I would say, I think our Google Docs are usually pretty good, but there, whenever our Google Docs do miss something, there's a big uproar in the class. Um, and I, I can't think of a recent example. I'm going to get one And it may be a like a group of three people and one person's wrong versus 156 eyes. Yeah. Someone's gonna catch it. I don't. I mean, I think that might be part of it for me. Is that like I know that there's multiple people checking it versus just if we're in a group of three people and one person misleads, you don't have as much um, counterbalance to it. I think the Google Docs is just like Wikipedia, but instead of thousands of people over the world, it's 156 people giving more or less the same answer. So it's exactly it's the margin of error. Obviously, is smaller, but yeah, there's also that. And we tend to we tend to um, write our sources. So whenever I see like one through five is written by Olivia and I'm like, okay, what sources did she use? And I'm just kind of see the class sources and four and three being something. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. Okay. I'm just saying, in addition to that, I think when most of the time people are doing the box, they are directly looking at a resource mm -hmm. versus in the class stuff, we're doing a lot of things from memory. Mm -hmm. So I think that's also a piece too, is that we might trip up when we're just trying to come up with the answer from memory as opposed to I'm writing this with the source right with me, so I'm able to kind of more be accurate. And for me, I feel like the expert feedback makes a huge difference um, because yeah. it's like 100% confident and like you know that this is the answer. And they also usually explain it a lot better. I mean, you have all seen that material so much more than we have. Um, and so obviously it's going to be more eloquently explained. <laughs> um, and sometimes, yeah, we'll get the right answer, but we may not have gotten there in the right way. And so I, I think it's so much more helpful to get that expert feedback at the end. You're yeah, so 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 so
But what they're saying is, we'll talk to each other, but when we're ready for the large group discussion, we don't want to tell you what we think. We want you to tell us, right? <laughs> so this eliminates the part where you hear from them. <laughs> you know, they prefer that we would skip that. But the instructor, that's the part you want to do because you want to see what they're thinking, right? Mm -hmm. Ed, well, I'll, I'll <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, I think, like, when it's then, like, okay, our feedback is like a clicker question or something. I think that, I think we all like that, where it's like, okay, we discuss and then we do a clicker, but that's kind of our feedback to you. Where are we in our thinking as opposed to necessarily verbalizing it? That way we can see what everyone thinks, but we're not like, are they right or are they not? Yeah, because. Like, mm -hmm. So I was thinking about, so if I uh, asked you, so tell us what you think about this. If, if you gave me one sentence and I said yes, and then you went on one sentence, yes. You could follow that and like that. But if I let you go on for 15 sentences and then I said, yes, the rest of the class would be, I missed it. I yeah, missed it. yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the idea would be to keep the feedback short, exactly. right? So they yeah. say something that's instructed right in there all the time, right? And that way the students have a sense that it's moving. More than just the feedback, keeping the feedback short, but keeping the answers from the students short. Yeah. That, that, I don't think, is probably the most important thing, right? <laughs> yes, no, you can follow up. Right? <laughs> yeah, train of thought on why you should have chosen this differential in the class to ask the student, can you explain what you think about this answer? Often, if the student is not eloquent or if the student doesn't know what's going on, then it becomes uh, five or ten minutes of confusion and not paying attention. And often the mic's not working or the speaker's <laughs> And, for example, like at Dr. Bloody's lecture um, about like the pathology, you actually had a question to go and explain. Um, no, no, sorry, it was the uh, endocrinology uh, pregnancy. Oh. Uh, one of our classmates, he really, he really understands the student well, and he still was really fast. So like, it was really hard to follow his explanation, and the only thing that helped me understand was when Dr. Bray sent out an explanation piece after class. <laughs> so I, I, think it's, I think it's very valuable for you to see how we answer, but it's not the most effective way to do that in class. I feel compelled to so, so toss something at me to react to. I think, I think the faculty are asking you to tell how your group thought about a, a problem so that they understand your thought process. Because if you have the right thought process, then you can apply it to a novel situation, that's what we would believe. Rather than the faculty just telling you the answer, which you're now memorizing for that one case. Okay? Now, in a novel situation, can you really then uh, solve the problem? That, that's, that's the paradigm, and so I'm trying to figure out if we skip that part, it's the same as just memorizing stuff, right? I, so one thing that I brought up last time, I think DI was a, about as perfectly done as a school could be done, in my opinion. Um, Maximize the education. <laughs> <laughs> just trying to get that on the screen. No, uh, well, because I, it was one of the schools where everyone after the summative from what I'd heard, you know, they're all saying, oh, these weren't first order questions at all. And um, we were constantly getting cases that we would have to fill out on case school and um, where we, we would be faced with like novel cases. And somehow I think we were all learning. And I, I, don't, I don't know what DI yeah, did right. <laughs> Um, but I, I know, like, for example, I really like Dr. Saad's sessions. He would pick, like, a lot. We would do tons of cases. And after a while, I think you could see, like, a pat yeah, you could see patterns on, like, how to think or, um, you know, I started recognizing, like, okay, certain blood tests are indicating certain things. And so it would be, a, um, in, in class, those sessions would present, like, probably any other active learning session, you know. Um, there would be a case, there would be a clicker, you know, people would talk a little bit. And then I don't think we really spent that much time on, like, um, explaining of it, but it would be like we would see so many cases that it just started to become innate in our heads and we could see patterns and so when we did get a new like case tool type of question and those cases were often like pretty hard if you guys remember like they're like you can use any source you want and I was always on up to date because I didn't know what's going on um, but we were still able to think through it because we had already been equipped with like the right patterns and stuff to think about. I was going to say something that really, I think one of the reasons we hate the student feedback is it's always in the end of an already long mm -hmm. session. So I think it's like the time thing. We're already like in a time where we're zoning out and processing attention. So if we had a situation where we had to answer something by ourselves and then you asked us and it was what we had just worked on, I think it would be much more likely to pay attention to the student feedback than, for example, at the end of like seven questions or eight questions in the CBL, I'm not going to <coughs> I put in my energy over there, so. 
be able to speak up and test, but I think especially if it's for a session where maybe it's a difficult topic and we're not pros on it yet, um, I really don't like to be like put on the spot like that. Whereas it's not so bad, I think if you give us some time to think it through and then you kind of ask like, okay, who at this table do you want to talk about it? I think that's my answer. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> cold calling. Cold calling. Like a cold call table, table. That's not as bad. Yeah, cold call table. So then if you like come up to us and you're like putting your microphone in front of us, I, I go to like 99% of the classes, but I will not go to those classes. <laughs> um, and so I think that's just kind of a personal thing. But uh, I feel like, I, I know other people feel the same way. And I think we tend to sit through really tense, but I can't really focus. And so I just like it better if it's like a group thing. Okay. Um, so I think for me, it, I think I highlighted sort of what was positive, which was pre-work and then reward. Um, the, the flip side of that would be to ask for a lot of pre-work, come into class, and then have it be sort of a complete regurgitation of the same pre-work that you assigned. I think, those, I mean, those are the types of sessions, despite um, my belief that it's disrespectful to leave, I'll leave. Because it, it, I'm not going to sit there for two hours and sort of relearn what I spent all of last night doing. Um, so I think that's probably like the number one thing for me. Um, and then similarly, uh, there's the timing. I'd like to reiterate the timing. So something that can be done in an hour of class that stretches to two or three uh, is, is refreshing. Um, <laughs> I think that's probably it. I think the resources have been a point where I would, I think, make sessions more or less useful to me and um, being assigned resources that are not that are not as effective and as concise as they could be really frustrates me because I only have so much time to learn and I want to learn what you want us to learn but being assigned like multiple chapters and a textbook along with maybe a video and maybe some articles and I is not good. I don't I don't think that that's that's effective and I don't think that that's a responsible way for um, lectures to tell students what to learn. So I would appreciate um, before any active learning, even any passive learning classes, to be given more concise resources. Mm -hmm. I don't, I don't like if it's from a lecture, even better. I just, I would like to see that. Also, PowerPoints, if they could be uh, sent to us earlier. <laughs> um, that I know it's a, it's a small thing, but having a, having a PowerPoint for class and being able to take notes on the right slides, especially if it's a solid, being able to draw on it being able to write right under the slide what was happening in class, it makes a world of difference in how I feel and how organized my, my mind is for the lecture. So if there could be, uh, if, if people could give their PowerPoint to my own assistant leaders so they could give it out to students, yeah, I would love that. So Connie, if you, if you look at the pre-work for session, it looks to you to be expensive. What's your most likely response to that? Is it a and you look at the Google Doc and look at the resources, which is a waste because if I have time, I would do all of it. It's, I don't want to be a slacker. You know, I don't want to feel like I'm missing out on a little bit of information that could be like really important to my knowledge. There, there's just not enough time to do it. Will it change your willingness to come to the class and do the active learning part? I don't know. <laughs> it depends on how good the Google Doc is. How far before class does the Google Doc come out? The Google Doc, so I, I'm one of the people who does the Google Doc like committee or whatever. Um, we put we put them up. Um, this is why I constantly request that you guys need to put LOs up early because we put them up that weekend before the class, and then um, authors are supposed to write their stuff up at least two days in advance. So um, that gives people time to are reviewing ahead to start looking at things over and over again. But then they're also we're all, we also request that everyone um, updates them after class, and then it's just a constant state. The Google Doc is always getting edited, but um, it should be officially up about a week. It's a doc is up a week before, and then answers should be filled in about two days. <laughs> Often purposely try to put parallel learning materials that are totally overlapping so that people can choose their approach, I guess. And is that I contributing to the confusion or yeah. the overload? In other words, often when a CRL is posted, the PowerPoint alone that was used to make it is also posted. Mm -hmm. We're hoping people realize that they should choose one or the other. Often we're posting a handout and a PowerPoint that are on exactly the same territory. Although obviously you don't have the visual opportunities in the handout situation, we expect people to use 
one or the other, but taken together, that can look like all sorts of required I, 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 really, I support all having multiple versions of the same amount of information. I think that's I think that's lectures being accepted to that student at different learning styles. And I think that's great. All you have to do is say we don't think. No, I think the word or is really missing from like the instructions because there's a list of required material and I do usually only do the PowerPoint or the handout, but I always feel bad and I always come into class thinking that I don't know something because I chose one or the other. Finding this day or equivalent is a great yeah, yeah. It's or need to do better on the structure. I think some have actually very few. There have been some when, it, when it's been clearly the same material. Have sometimes mentioned. I remember a few examples where it has. And I will say, I think all, most people who do the zero, when the PowerPoint is also attached, is super helpful. Same kind of thing with when we're in class, because then you can type along with the PowerPoint that matches the zero and keep your notes. That's really really helpful. Um, and I think sometimes when that's the case when they like insert it into the instruction into the online it says like prl powerpoint so then you know it's the prl powerpoint so you're not um confused if it's two different pages of material then you know it goes with the powerpoint and i think those are actually really helpful to have because then you can follow along and it's and you know it's not duplicate you can see that it's written in the same way so but that's not the kind of that's not what we mean by seeing resources <laughs> i think we're talking about a lot of like book chapters or a lot of handouts then the, I don't know, then like book chapter and then something else. And yeah, that's where you just click. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they're, they're more, they're like what you want us to know. You know, you can tell them something. And so you, I, will, I will read that. But um, yeah, I guess if you have PowerPoint with extensive notes and then you have a PRL, if you could just write a quick note. So we wrote most of the notes that we're going to say in the PRL on the PowerPoint. So if you want to listen, you can, but you don't have to. So we know there's not information we're missing if we don't look at the notes. Which oh, yeah. So I wrote, yeah. So I, um, in regards, I agree with everyone else. Um, I like that uh, rewarding pre work and when it's not being rewarded or we're just regurgitating. I hate those sessions because I always um, prepare and if I'm just sitting in a class and hear the same stuff that I've already spent time on, it's really frustrating. Um, and then I also want to reiterate the timing. Although I do want to um, clarify, I think how much time you give give us to answer and work on things depends a lot on what level of um, question you're asking. So if it's um, a very first level question, it should be like instantaneous. We shouldn't be given, you know, more than a few minutes to do it. But um, if it, there have been a few sessions, um, okay, <laughs> what I tell would be, um, I think we've had a few MSI ones where they involve a lot of like thinking about, you're looking for a certain nerve doing this thing um, versus upper here it doesn't like up here it doesn't do this thing and so you're trying to like or localizing lesions things that involve a lot more thinking um i i think there have been just a handful of sessions where we weren't given enough time so um i think trying to um you i think something would be really helpful is if we could figure out if you guys could figure out um you know what level of answer and what level of question are you guys um, expecting from us and then accommodate the time to fit that better because um it's usually it's on par, but sometimes, it, most of the time, I feel like we get too much time for the level of answer that you're looking for. But if it is, like an example would be um, when we had, what is it called, the litter diagram ones in um, cardiac, I think we didn't have like enough time at all to draw those because, I mean, litter diagrams take a lot to think through. Um, so we compared, to, so in those sessions, we clearly did not have enough time. But then there are a ton of other sessions, though, where um, you're giving us like 10 minutes to discuss something as simple as, do you expect these flow levels to be up or down? And that shouldn't take that much time. Nothing to add? Anybody else thinking of other things? There was something else that just came to my mind. Oh, because it's already gotten a problem. We've had a few things in class where it's like the, like make a PowerPoint and teach it to your fellow students. And we just felt it's normally just like. Now you know how we feel. Different. It came up a few different times in different formats, um, but anytime where it was like half the class study this material, half the class study this material beforehand, and then you come and those two groups are going to compare together and you're going to teach the other side, 
I mean, you knew your material pretty well, but you didn't really know the other half very well, and it was, uh, I don't think it worked out that well. I think what we um, said last time about that is, I think in general, we don't like learning new stuff from each other. Um, so that would be an example of, you know, one half of class is responsible for learning something that the other class didn't even look at. And um, those are really hard to learn from, especially because we're not even sure how well the other group knows it, and we don't know what they're teaching versus what level you guys want us to know. Um, so I think that would be a time when active learning probably maybe is not, not ready for it. Yeah, we, yeah that's what we said. we're not ready for the active learning yet. <laughs> we haven't. And the, what she said was that it, it, was, it was brand new material from both times when we did it. It wasn't even like, let's build on it. It was first time ever seeing it. and. So it wasn't really an application of yeah. material, it was the teaching yeah. material. I mean, is that related to timing? Like, in other words, if right. there's a session right after there's been a big exam, are there times that, I mean, you were saying that people will walk out of a session with pure regurgitation, but if it's a whole active application session and people don't feel that right. they've mastered the material enough that they're going to be humiliated in class and not get it, would people be less likely to come for that as well? Or? Is there a grade attached to it? <laughs> <laughs> no, let's say there's no so, grade attached. Yeah, I think that's a big consideration. I, I, yeah, I think it's. If there was a certain level of pre-work that was required and people couldn't meet that pre-work and thought they were going to be cold called, for instance, and didn't want to be humiliated or say, yeah, they probably say otherwise, oh, TRL. I think the problem sets, which were not mandatory, meaning they didn't have a grade, even if they were mandatory, if they didn't have a grade, people will not come. I think they're actually great because the people who are there are the people who want to come to class and who had time to prepare. And I found that like my interaction with them is just phenomenal. Whereas when everyone has to come, you can just tell some people are kind of off. They're there because they have to. They hate going to class to begin with. They're in a bad mood because they woke up early. <laughs> and um, I just I, I don't think they're as productive as when the people who are there, people who prepared and want to be there. So it's small. It's like half the class usually. But I don't know. Hmm. can I ask you what about let's say uh, someone did a good job of not making the class really active. So the PowerPoint slides for that class are either clicker question, take home message, clicker question, take home message, or exercise, take home point. Mm -hmm. So the question is, if you get those slides in advance, how does that work in terms of now you've got the take home point um, uh, no, in advance, no, or you've got the answers no, to the clicker question? No, no, no. Okay. <laughs> I think with that, I mean, I, it seems like a lot of professors don't want to give us the slides before because they think we're going to look at all the questions look at all the answers, but at least I think we at least want it like the morning of, like right before the class starts. So you have them in lecture, but yeah, not necessarily in lecture. Yeah, and then if, and if you do have it up, I I never look at it. I think most people don't, and if the people are going to look and are going to like uncover the boxes and look like they're going to do it, and like they're kind of you know, old school thing. But <laughs> I think most people don't. How do you like that? Guys? I know Barton Nathan's like the black box. Do yeah. a lot of people do that? Or? Some people don't like the black right. box, but even if it's like a duplicate slide, like the first slide is, doesn't have the answer, but has the question, and then the next slide, and it's like, don't go to the next slide, and the next slide is the answer, <laughs> or you just tell at the beginning, like, don't go to the next slide until we talked about it. Like, most go. people will do it because yeah. you want to actively learn too and, like, see right. if you worked it out. Yeah. So even if it's the first one's just the questions and there's no answer, and then the next one's there, but you haven't gone to it yet, like, you have it, so you can take your notes alongside of it, but you haven't looked at it in advance to know the answer. I think, uh, I think just people object to calling it an honor code violation, given that you single thing to call, like, you know, the whole CBA policy saying that, like, you deleted a black box and saw an answer on a PowerPoint is somehow going to, you know, school because it's an honor code. Like, it's, that, I think that's what people are reacting to. Uh, I would say some people don't like it because they print it into their yeah. like iPad and then that's they can't fix it. I don't think that's why I think it's I ridiculous. think the honor box is like one of the most useful things you can do because if you do this just beforehand, you can't see the answers, you can see the questions. Right. Okay. And it's, it, I mean, I think it's a student's responsibility to realize that if they really want to actively learn and get something out of it instead of passively read through the answers, they won't uncover it. And if they will, that's their prerogative. I don't, I don't, I'm just saying, I think people take it off not, or, People aren't mad about the boxes because they don't want to take it off. It's just ease of use kind of thing yeah. because they put it into their iPad and then they can't. Okay. So they put it but in would with you the prefer boxes. that or would you prefer having professors just mail out a post class? No, no, no that's what I was saying. Some people, <laughs> exactly. thought, some people thought like a compromise would be is one that didn't have any boxes. You just had don't go to the next slide. Yeah. Yeah. We talked about this I think in the um, renal physical meeting, but it was like 
Uh, I think we all agree that we like it when you have, here's a question, stop sign. So we know, like, stop here, don't advance. But then the next slide isn't covered, it's not hidden from us, but the answer is there. We just know we should stop there because, I mean, I think for most of us, we're in medical school because we want to learn. So I think most of us aren't trying to, you know, figure out the answer so that way they can get a little bit ahead. We're, we actually want to think about it. Um, and yeah, I would say, like, I don't like the honor boxes because I am also one of the people who, like, prints the PowerPoint into, um, a note-taking tool, and if you have black boxes there, now I don't, I can't move the black box once it's been printed in. So then I have to go through manually and delete all the black boxes beforehand, and then print them back in, and it just takes more time for me. Whereas um, I will, list, I will stop if you want me to stop. If you tell me to on the PowerPoint, I'll stop there and think, and then move on to the next slide. So. Well, alternatively, if, if because you don't want them to see the answer, you give us a post-class version of the PowerPoint, that wastes time for me because I have a pre-class version, I wrote all my class notes into it, and then afterwards, even if you just don't know which one to study, you print out something that maybe five or six different slides for us to look at. You were saying post-class version. I think the I think the honor box is a good alternative to multiple versions of the same of the same honor box. Is, honor box is better than multiple versions. Yeah, but honor box is not the best. Yeah, multiple yeah, versions yeah. is the worst. I think you can all agree. <laughs> multiple <laughs> versions. Post class version is not <laughs> not a good thing. There are people who do PowerPoints, right, where they don't put the clicker questions in the PowerPoint, but they'll ask the slides other than the vignettes, let's like say, right? Is that? Yeah, like that yeah. Are you like having the whole thing? We like having the whole thing. Because then when we go back on it, it's all there, and then we just don't take notes on it. And like, we're not frantically like copying down the whole page in class. Right. Or yeah. say if you want to go back and look at a question, and it's not there, it's kind of like, oh, well, I know we talked about this in class. I wanted to try to remember what that thought process was, but I don't have that question. Especially with active learning, and it wasn't podcasted because it simply just kept on the same event. It's even harder to go back and review. Mm. So, in other words, you want all of these feedback opportunities in class to be available to your readers and along with yeah. readers. Mm -hmm. And I think it helps with our engaging. Personally, I engage more when I can take notes. If I can't, it's so much more easier for me to check out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will. I will leave classes if I can tell already that um, it's missing huge amounts of slides because I'm not going to take the time to write down all the information. Cause, you know, class moves too fast. I can't like write down everything if it's already missing. Um, and then we've had a few times when like there are slides with like awesome diagrams, and then we never even get to see those diagrams again. And I'm like, well, I really wanted that diagram. That was the one time I learned the material. And then you just don't give it to us. So um, I would really prefer that the class version is the same as the one that we get, so that way we can take notes right when it's happening in class. Any other questions? <laughs> <laughs> I have a question about timing these sessions. You talked about the pace within the session, but what about the overall time? You know, we, we struggle with how much time we should devote to our active learning sessions. And we hear, um, you know, some of them are a half an hour, some of them go four hours long, the entire morning. I mean, is there, a, is there a point where it's just no longer a value regardless of how well it's designed? Yeah. When is that? Yeah. <laughs> four hours, I think, is rarely, even if it's a good session, I think it will rarely be productive. Time. And I think usually two hours is a joint limit, but I, I honestly think it depends very much on the activity. Mm -hmm. But I think for TBL, we mentioned that. I think TBLs that are longer than two hours tend to lose us. Um, same with problem sets. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Or two hours is better. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's just pinned up to what's going on, though. Like, I know, I think they're like. I think there are like three or four hours so sometimes aren't like pathology problem sets, but they're like taking us like cases to go through and then we have like the growth assessments to look at and so like it's still very interactive for us to go through. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, yeah, I don't know. I can do four hours, I think it's just like kind of just is very sure. like, You've got lots of different things to do. Yeah. Yeah, I think like the four hour um, block we had for like kind of the guided breast malignancy mm -hmm. that we had like a week ago, mm -hmm. I thought that was a really good Hours. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I, I don't think it has very much to do with the actual length of the session. Although it could, you know, mm -hmm. some sessions are smaller than they should be. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's more about like how the time is used. Mm -hmm. So in other words, one of the worst things that you can do then is, is have a long session with the last hour to focus being uh, students. 
But I remember at least in the last week for sure, it was almost cases every single day yeah. at the first. And there was no lectures at that point. Like I was still coming to class because I wanted to like think ethically, I guess. Um, but that was helpful because we weren't getting like we weren't being forced to like do stuff that with material that we weren't comfortable with yet. Um, but then by the end of the session, that's why I think we all like those task labs too that we do at the end because by then you know we've been equipped enough with information that we can really like climb to that higher level by doing some active learning. So I think it's like really important to figure out when things fit into our overall like system. So we should clarify that for a system to be considered, for session to be considered active, it has to have 20 minutes out of 50 being active. If it does, this is going to be the criterion, if it's less than 20 out of 50, it's not active, it's elective. And so when the instructor's planning, you tell them that, you tell them shoot from 50 to 50 because then you're likely to get there. <laughs> um, but we always ask the students afterwards, what did you think? And the estimates are usually widely disparate, right? <laughs> so for exactly the same thing that everyone was in at one time, we get wild updates from the students. So, so 20 out of 50 needs to be active for instruction. How much of the learning curriculum needs to be active? Right. How much of the picture? For that? Of the entire right. curriculum. But it also depends on how you define active. In other words, it's the time that you're thinking, pairing, sharing. Ah. That's active. Yep. But what about activity is students talking to each other or back and forth with the instructor. That's the definition of active. Okay. So 20 minutes of that, and you're good. Out of 50. Okay. So 50 is. Well, that is fair. Um. <laughs> 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 there it is. There it is. There it is. <laughs> And any time the professor answers a student's question, that is not considered active because it's kind of a didactic, I'm telling you the answer. So there would be the duration. So if we're back and forth in conversation, that's active. But if I'm going to talk for 10 minutes, I have stepped over into lecturing. All right, so the observer makes a call. Is this still a dialogue or is somebody lecturing? Okay, so as long as there's a dialogue that involves the students responding yeah. and then another yeah. student could raise their hand and respond to that, that is all considered active. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I would say an example of that is when we do our like little groups in the library with a faculty member. And um, when I answer those on the way, I still put about like 25% um, faculty lecture because they are saying like, yes, this is how I, with my MD training, think about this. Um, but most of it is still us talking about it or us talking with the um, attending about it. So um, those sessions are like fabulous. <laughs> and I would count them entirely as active learning because just because we get a little bit, like, you know, 10 minutes of um, the faculty wrapping it up for us, I don't count that as lecture. That's like good job, good conclusion to your active learning session. Well, like I said, all the students are coming. This is really oh, okay. great. Oh, okay. um, I'm doing a lot of grading of subjects, and so I'm just wondering, is that actually valuable for you or not? Grading of what? And so I'm, I'm getting problems. Problems. Problem. Like problem. 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 So I'm grading them, but I'm also giving them the entry uh, complete as 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 a thing now. I think what Meredith said earlier is, I think a lot depends on what your expectations are. Um, so, I mean, we would say, like, the first time we had that session with you, I think we weren't sure what level you were looking out of us, but after that, we, we all knew, you know, we really got to prepare for mm -hmm. Dr. Keller's mm -hmm. session. And so we would all prepare a lot more, and then that made the sessions, I think, more useful. Right, like, Elena said last time, she would really like those, where um, we would fill out the worksheets, and we would do some for ourselves the questions, like, label the paraphernalia cell, but then the last few pages were all cases, and applying that knowledge. Those are, I think those are an example of a session like where it rewards through work. Yeah, the absolutely. more you prepare beforehand, the more you get out of it. I, I would second, like the second time around when I, I kind of said earlier, if we have an expectation of kind of what the session is going to look like, then it's great. So like the second time, I knew exactly what it was going to look like and I felt like I got a lot out of it. Um, and also in terms of the grading piece, having the response afterwards was, is really helpful, I think, in terms of just kind of the feedback we've all been mentioning and having your actual thought is nice to have. So do you guys open her first? Because I think what she does is you, she takes the time to freshman. Yeah. Right now. I personally don't open them. I just look at my grades. So yeah. I, I, what, do you guys open it? I, 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 I open the response. Okay. I 